the Crimean Peninsula. Lately, the Eastern European region, by the shores of the Black Sea, is receiving an increasing share in world news. Crimea has rarely been a subject of worldwide attention. The last time it went into top global news was as long ago as in 1945, when it hosted the Yalta Conference of the leaders of the United States, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union, which many think defined the post-war division of Europe. These days, the world is talking of Crimea again, this time in connection with Russia's swift taking control of the territory in March 2014. Some political scientists call this event the beginning of a new reshaping of national boundaries in Europe. Crimea has once again become a key square on the grand chessboard of international politics. Crimea entered the stage of world history a long time ago. This remote edge of Europe has long been an object of fierce competition and a highly valued war prize. Empires have clashed for the Crimean Peninsula and flags over it have changed many times. There are people, however, for whom Crimea is not just a pawn in the geopolitical game, but the only homeland they have on Earth. They are the Crimean Tatars, the native people of Crimea. Official statistics put their numbers in Crimea at around 250,000, which is probably slightly underrated. The voice of the Crimean Tatars is rarely heard on the international stage. What does the world know about them? The town of Bakhchisarai is the cultural capital of the Crimean Tatars, and it was once their political center as well. From the beginning of the 16th century up to 1783, when the Russian Empire annexed Crimea, Bakhchisarai was the capital of the Crimean Tatar state, the Crimean Khanate. The palace of its rulers, the Crimean Khans, remains in Bakhchisarai. It is a museum now. Prior to 2014, when transport communications with Ukraine were disrupted, more than half a million tourists visited the historical monument per year. Nowadays, the flow of visitors has noticeably decreased. Even despite the square at the palace gate being still quite a busy place. Streets in the old quarters of Bakhchisarai preserve many features of traditional Crimean Tatar architecture. The Crimean Tatars constitute currently about 20% of the town's population. This young Crimean Tatar couple, Eldar and Alimeh, have unusual jobs. They both work on preserving the vanishing traditional crafts of the Crimean Tatars. They will be our guides into the world of memories and hopes of the people who have unexpectedly found themselves behind the new Iron Curtain. Eldar is keen on the craft of pottery. He creates elegant works of traditional folk art on his potter's wheel. In the past, articles like these were routinely used in any Crimean Tatar dwelling. My parents told me that the family of my great-grandfather Mehmed came from Kozlev Plains. Kozlev was the largest town in the steppe region of the Crimea. The clan of our ancestors, the Mansurs, was a noble one. The family of Mehmet possessed two houses in the town and large herds of sheep on the plains.
Sometimes Eldar pays a visit to the homeland of his great-grandfathers in the blossoming Crimean steppes. A saddle horse is a rarity in modern Crimea, but Eldar recalls centuries-old traditions. The Mongol conquest of the 13th century was a disaster both for Eastern Europe and for Crimea. The Mongols subdued Turkic cattle breeders that inhabited local steppes. However, the handful of conquerors quickly dissolved among the local population. In just two centuries, their common descendants fought together to defend the peninsula from new invasions from the continent. Alime is an embroideress. Graceful Crimean Tatar ornaments of flowers and leaves blossom on her canvas. Crimean Tatar embroidery is full of symbols. A tulip, for instance, means a boy and an almond means a girl. A rose symbolizes a woman and those small things represent abundant crops. In the past, girls embroidered such items for their future husbands. I found this pattern on an old headscarf and now I am trying to recreate it. This embroidery technique is called Tata Ishlem. There are more than 60 types of Tata Ishlem. The roots of the fine plants growing from under her needle reach deep into the historical past. Quite similar ornaments have been blossoming since the ancient times on the embroidery of the Balkans and Levant. Alime's ancestors come from the highlands of Crimea, which for millennia have been the ultimate frontier of the Mediterranean world. Ancient Greece and Rome knew the peninsula very well, both as a supplier of bread and as the scene for some famous antique dramas. More than 2,000 years ago, dwellers of the ancient city of Kersonesos on the Crimean shores pledged in their citizenship oath to protect democracy from usurpation. Windows and doors of man-made caves gape in the majestic rocks of the Crimean mountains. These are the remnants of medieval fortresses. Ancient highlanders of Crimea, allied to the Constantinople emperors, built their mountain strongholds to guard the farthest frontier of the Byzantine Empire from the steppe nomads. The Byzantine Epoch left its mark in Crimean temples more than a thousand years old. The peninsula has long been a true melting pot for all the ethnicities that have ever come here over the centuries. The list of ancient peoples that at some point came to Crimea and settled here forever is extensive. The Tory and the Cimmerians, the Greeks and the Scythians, the Goths and the Alans, the Khazars and the Cumans, as well as the more recent Mongols and Turks. Many of these ancient peoples have long disappeared. However, living humans do not disappear into oblivion. They live on in their descendants, mixing among themselves and incorporating subsequent waves of newcomers, the descendants of those who had come to Crimea from opposite ends of the continent, had merged by the late Middle Ages into a new ethnicity, the Crimean Tatars. The factor which united the steppe dwellers and the highlanders into a single nation was the faith of Islam. From the very beginning of its spread in Crimea, it was distinguished by a tolerance unusual 
in many other countries of the Orient. By the 15th century, Crimea threw off the power of the Golden Horde, the successor of the Mongol Empire, and became an independent state, the Crimean Khanate. The main reminder of this state remains the Bakhisarai Palace of the Crimean Khans. The assimilation of various traditions gave rise to a unique culture of the Crimean Khanate, which comprised the legends of Anatolia and the architecture of the Renaissance, Arabic calligraphy and Balkan music. Gaze Gire II, a Crimean Khan who lived in the second half of the 16th century and at the beginning of the 17th century, could rightfully be considered one of the most outstanding figures in Crimean history. Gazi Gire had a versatile personality of a true master of pen and sword. He had been ruling Crimea for 20 years, proving himself as a powerful ruler and a wise politician. The Khan spent much of his lifetime in military campaigns, experiencing both the joy of victory and the agony of defeat. He earned a place in Crimean history as one of the most prominent military leaders of the time. Along with that, Ghazi Gire left a valuable heritage in the cultural life of Crimea. He was famous as a talented poet, a musician who mastered many different instruments, a composer who left about 70 known musical compositions, a calligrapher and a patron of the arts. The Crimean Tatar state didn't remain independent for a long time. A new big brother was soon to succeed the Golden Horde in stretching its power over Crimea, the mighty Ottoman Empire. The Crimean Khanate did not pursue conquering foreign territories, while its patriarchal economy did not require a slave workforce. But the Ottoman sultans were in an eager need of both. The Sultan subordinated the Crimean Khans and actively used the Crimean army on their numerous campaigns. Raids of Crimean Tatar light cavalry reminded Eastern and Central Europe of the times of Genghis Khan. And when in the 18th century the weakening Ottoman Empire entered its period of decline, Crimea remained against its angry neighbors on its own. In 1783, a new wave of conquerors fell onto Crimea, the Russian Empire. The ancient order, which had made all previous invaders mix eventually with the locals and become the children of this land, no longer had any place in the age of classic colonialism. Russians were aspiring to build a new Crimea, their own one. Ancient Greece, Byzantium and Turkey perceived the peninsula as their far north outlying frontier. For Russia, in contrast, it was the only piece of a subtropical paradise within the borders of the frozen empire. And in this cramped paradise, there was not too much space left for the indigenous population. Successive Russian emperors generously granted ownership rights over these blessed lands to their minions, court and military officials. Free land in Crimea was scarce, therefore Russian authorities had a vested interest in as many Crimean Tatars leaving the peninsula as possible. Sometimes even suggestions of their forced eviction sounded although the imperial government never dared take such a barbaric step. It's calculated that in the few first decades after the annexation, about three-fifths of the total Crimean Tatar population left the peninsula seeking refuge in Turkey. The policy of expulsion continued well into the 19th century, 
The Eastern War of 1853 to 56, well commemorated in Europe, alongside the names of Inkerman, Balaclava, and the fatal Charge of the Light Cavalry Brigade, had its impact on the Crimean Tatars even after it had finished had allegedly aided the occupying troops of Great Britain, France, Sardinia and Turkey during their stay in Crimea, the Russian authorities increased repressions against the Crimean Tatars, forcing about 150,000 Crimean Tatars to a new exodus to Turkey. Although there had never been any anti-colonial movement or uprisings in Crimea, the Russian authorities held the Crimean Tatars in great distrust. No wonder then that the Crimean Tatars met the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917 enthusiastically. The revolution brought the deprived people aspirations for self-determination. Crimean Tatar political and cultural activists convened the Kurultai, or General Assembly of People's Representatives. However, making up by then merely a quarter of the total Crimean population, the Crimean Tatar community could not unilaterally decide the future of the peninsula. In 1917 to 1921, Crimea became a battlefield of a fierce fight between the defending Russian monarchists and the advancing Bolsheviks, which ended in a bloody victory for the latter. Trying to secure support from ethnic minorities, communists declared a policy of liberation of peoples previously oppressed by Tsarism. The Crimean Tatars trustfully accepted the Soviet plan of establishment of Crimean Tatar national autonomy on the peninsula. They willingly participated in socialist transformations and became one of the fastest developing communities among the Muslim peoples of the former empire. This was, however, just an ideological trap. The communists started the policy of indigenization after 1922. From then on, they tried to recruit Crimean Tatars into their party and Soviet governmental structures. Politicians protected the interests of the people. On the educational front, they opened schools and higher educational institutions. On the one side, the policy had some positive effects, while on the other side, all these advances were cut down pretty soon. In the mid-1930s, repressions started, culminating in 1937 and 1938. On April the 17th, 1938, all leading Crimean Tatar intellectuals were executed here in Simferopol. That night, the intellectual elite of an entire people vanished. In 1941, new flags were raised over Crimea. The peninsula was occupied by Nazi Germany. Just like the communists before them, the Nazis initially tried to exploit the slogans of national liberation. Their success proved to be poor, as there were no significant anti-Soviet sentiments among the Crimean Tatars. A similar failure met their attempts at recruiting Crimean Tatars to Nazi battalions, which never equaled the numbers of Crimean Tatars fighting in the ranks of the Soviet army. Nevertheless, after the Nazi withdrawal from Crimea, the Soviet authorities accused all the Crimean Tatars of collaboration with the enemy. This was the pretext for indiscriminate deportation of people from Crimea. On May the 18th, 1944, the entire Crimean Tatar population of the peninsula, including even communist functionaries and disabled Red Army veterans, was forcibly loaded in cattle vans and driven out of Crimea to Central Asia. This act of Stalinist terror was unusually based not on ideological, but exclusively on racial grounds. During the deportation and the first years in exile, by some estimates, up to 46% of the Crimean Tatars died. 
many people in Crimea still remember those events. The memory of this act of genocide is a never healing scar in the history of any Crimean Tatar family. We children were scared. Soldiers drove us into trucks, then loaded us into railroad cars. Everything was a mess. Families were split and scattered. My brother was in Sinferopol that day. The father was there, the mother was here, the children elsewhere. People died on the way. Some tried to find their parents and were lost. We never, ever found my brother. Remaining in exile for almost half a century, people never gave up their hope of returning home. Such a return only became possible in the late 1980s as a result of perestroika. Many people left everything they owned in Central Asia and moved to the land of their fathers. Local authorities in some places in Crimea met their arrival with undisguised hostility. Most of those repatriated were born in exile and had never seen Crimea before. However, just like their deported parents, they thought of Crimea as their only true homeland. Many of those repatriated had to settle in makeshift houses, suffering from unemployment and poverty. But their ultimate values laid not in material benefits, but in regaining their once stolen homeland. The authorities in the city council just plainly refused to help us. They told us, we didn't call you here, so we settled in a shanty house and lived there for eight years. Sometimes we could not even afford to buy food. In Uzbekistan, we used to have a house with a garden, but we were living in a dream of coming back to Crimea. We never regret our return to Crimea. It's our homeland. The fall of the Soviet Union and the ensuing economic crisis fell on the height of the mass returning to Crimea. After the collapse of the USSR, Crimea remained in the borders of independent Ukraine. The government of one of the poorest European countries, engulfed by its own problems, could render little help to the repatriates. In any case, Ukrainian rule has become the first since 1783 under which the Crimean Tatars did not experience political repressions. abruptly changed in the spring of 2014. The flags over Crimea were changed once again when Russia rapidly took control over the peninsula. The Crimean Tatars have had a rich experience of life under the Russian state, an experience that has always been difficult and often even fraught with tragedy. It is understandable then that the return of Russian rule causes serious concerns among the Crimean Tatar community and the following Russian policy towards them seems to give few reasons for changing that attitude. Meanwhile, the Crimean Tatars cannot afford a new exodus as they have paid too high a price for their recent return. On their return to Crimea, our parents endured great trials and suffering. Many of those who had been evicted didn't live until the return and never saw Crimea again. That's why those who have managed to come back must stay in Crimea by any means. And not just to stay, but also to make our way as a modern, talented and resilient people, however difficult it is. Escape is not a solution. Crimea is our only homeland, and we have to stay here both in happy and in sad days, whatever is happening. Whatever the changes they are facing now, 
It's nothing more than a brief episode in the long history of the indigenous people of Crimea. Mighty empires have been clashing for Crimea since ancient times, and each new winner believes he has secured his foot on this land forever. But the Crimean Tatars have seen not a few shifts of power over the centuries. Empires have come and gone, while the native people remain the custodians of this amazingly beautiful land. What do the Crimean Tatars expect from the future? What are they hoping for? Our parents and grandparents lived through much worse circumstances. We are a resilient people. The main thing is that we are in our homeland now.